and turn to Matthew chapter 10. We'll read the first 23 verses. The last verses will be my text, verses 16 through 23. To them we'll pay close attention. In Matthew chapter 10, and the great commission of Jesus Christ of his 12 disciples, sending them into the nation of Israel, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, first of all, and presaging their being sent into all the world at the end of Matthew, the end of this uh, Jesus' earthly ministry in Matthew 28. Matthew 10, And when he had called, Jesus had called his twelve disciples to him. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. What follows is my text, verses 16 through 23. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about, or, about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Thus far we read these words of Jesus to the disciples as he's commissioning them to go, into, uh, to go on his behalf to the lost sheep of, house of the house of Israel and even to the Gentiles. We have been considering the instructions of Jesus to the twelve apostles that he had made disciples and who had been learning from him. And now he gives them instructions about what they are to do on his behalf. He's commissioning them to be his agents of peace and truth and of the glory of God. Jesus calls them to be uh, those who are preachers of the kingdom of heaven, calls them to call people to repent uh, for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He instructs them as well that... Uh, uh, or he, he empowers them as well with great miracles to cast out all kinds of demons, to cure diseases, and to heal them in all manner of sicknesses, and this on his behalf. Jesus himself reminds them that they are to be uh, devoted to the business. They are not to be those who would care about the things of the world, even 
then they should not even provide for themselves gold or silver or anything that would be necessary for themselves. They were to trust in the Lord. And they were to show, even as the priests who went to the temple and had nothing to encumber them in their business of sacrifice and prayer, that they were bent on serving the Lord in this wonderful occupation of apostle of Jesus Christ. We are told as well that they are to count houses worthy who receive them and their words, but also to shake off their feet in judgment upon those houses that did not receive them. At this time, in our text, Jesus reminds them of their reception. He warns them that it will be a difficult task that they are about because they are sent as sheep among the wolves. There will be rejection of them at every turn, in every matter of society, in every echelon of society. Wherever they go, they are going to be met with opposition. Jesus warns them of this, he reminds them of this, and he even starts his whole section here in verse 16 and following with a behold. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, he says. And then he gives uh, different instructions and warnings and exhortations and encouragements with regard to this solemn uh, reception or this solemn warning that he reminds them of. And so we ought to remember this for ourselves because this lesson that was given to the apostles is given to the church that is on their behalf as well as the behalf of Jesus. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, we also are those who meet opposition on every side. and We should receive the encouragement as well that Jesus sends us out, but he will save us and he will be with us all the way to the end. So congregation, let's hear Jesus' words as he sends the apostles to the wolves. And that's the title of my sermon, To the Wolves. And we want to consider, first of all, the situation in which the apostles and the church and we individual believers find ourselves in this world as sheep among wolves. Then we want to consider the sending out of Jesus, for it is, after all, a very peculiar thing that a good shepherd would send his sheep to the wolves. We want to consider what that means. And finally, we want to consider the salvation that he promises Indeed, when he says, you will be hated by all men for my name's sake, he says, he endures to the end, will be saved. That promise is sure, and we can rely on it as well. So to the wolves, first of all, the situation. Sheep are sent out to the wolves. And what Jesus is saying here is describing the great antithesis that there is between his people and and the people of the world. The people of the world are described here as wolves. They are the sons of the devil in themselves as sons of Adam who are not redeemed. These are the wolves so described here. They are those with teeth. They are those with claws. They are ravenous. And the sheep are helpless against those wolves. They are themselves just sheep, defenseless as all sheep are, uh, against any sorts of predators, prone to disease, prone to wander, prone to make themselves sick, prone in every way to destruction. But the, when they're among wolves, this surely is the greatest of the plagues that can come upon them, the most threatening, because wolves will give them no mercy. Wolves are wolves. We believe not in evolution, but in devolution, and the way that it works is that men have progressed in their wolfishness since day one of the fall, and they become more rapacious. They have become more greedy for the flesh, especially of the sons of God. Give me a son of God. Give me a daughter of God, and I will be glad, says the wolf, the evil man, and this is what the wolves describe, evil men who is faced with a sheep of God. And so this is what you have here. And you have these wolves who are not just simply timid, but they are, as they always are, ravenous. They are hungry for the flesh, hungry for the vulnerable, would single out the children maybe of the flock or the young people of the flock with their 
uh, devices and eat them up if possible. These are wolves who are, after all, on the behalf of a lion. And that lion is not the lion Jesus, but the lion who is described as the ravening lion, the devil himself. The wolves are in his behalf. So you have this description here of what's called the antithesis, the spiritual separation that God himself puts between sheep and wolves. He makes them of a kind of different species. Humans, we all are, but certain human beings are still in their sins, and they are still developing in their sinfulness, developing sharper claws and sharper teeth and a greater appetite and wisdom and shrewdness to gather into their teeth and into their stomachs the, wool, the, the sheep of Jesus Christ. This is the case, it's ever been the case since day one, I say, and increasingly is so. Do you know that? People of God, I trust that you have experienced something of the wolves in your life this, this week even because that's what we are in the midst of. And Jesus is saying here something that's an established truth since the fall. I send you out as sheep, you disciples, and there are wolves, and there are wolves, and they are everywhere. In fact, Jesus describes this uh, antithesis in different ways. He's saying to the sheep in different places, it's given to you not only to believe, but to suffer for Christ's sake. And that's because of the wolves. We suffer because of the, the temptations of the devil and the bites and the assaults and, the, uh, dis and the, the danger of all these wolves on every side. Jesus would say later on in John 15 that you'll be hated because I was hated. It's on behalf of Jesus. That's the problem. That's why the wolves hate the sheep. And when the disciples would bring the word of God, this would be the problem. They are on behalf of Jesus Christ, and that's why they suffer for his sake. More on that presently. These wolves, these greedy and these eager for flesh of the sheep wolves, are described here as being prevalent, in fact, in all corners of society. There's no less than four of them. We are to be, we're in this situation, Jesus reminds us, where we, buy, we have religious wolves. Verse 17, he says, Beware of men, they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. Now the men here are the wolves who take on sheep's clothing. They're religious men. The men of the Jewish religion of those days, who would be in the synagogues, the centers of worship for most of the Jews, and they would have their councils. And their councils, we're told, were made up of no less than 23 men of the synagogues who would punish people who were uh, against the peace of Israel. And when it's said here that we should beware of them who will deliver you up to councils, therefore, it's church councils, religious councils, and there in the setting of the Jews, the synagogue councils, the, the committee of the wise men who would decide who were the troublemakers in Israel and who were the true people of God who kept the commandments, especially of the Pharisees and the scribes. It said here that their threat is that they would scourge you in their synagogues. And that's a reference to the whipping uh, with leather thongs, sometimes to which was tied uh, pieces of glass or, or rock, which would inflict great wounds upon the backs of those who were scourged. Jesus himself was scourged this way, uh, when he was persecuted at the end of his life. Paul was, later on, by the counsels of these men who would decide who were the troublemakers. Well, Jesus says, beware of them. You will be delivered up to councils. There is a religious persecution, and there is as well today. In our day, there's a religious persecution, increasingly. Uh, and the councils are not of the synagogue, of course, but maybe they're of the classes. Maybe they're of consistories and councils of a church that are demagogues and lords over the flock and against which we're expressly warned uh, in 1 Peter 5. But be that as it may, it is increasing. And there's this wolvishness of those who disguise themselves with religious piety that is a danger to the flock. 
And so, more on how we should react to that later, but there is this religious affront. Besides that, there's a civil uh, area in which a civil, uncivil civil area of political dis- uh, persecution, which is warned against in verses 9 and 18 and following. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And then he says, do not, uh, when they deliver you up, do not worry and so on. More on that in the second point as well. But governors and kings, and we're seeing that I I believe, especially now even in America, when the heat is on and the pandemic is promoting this great fear among people, well, the church is getting uh, squashed out of existence, as it were. It's a kind of persecution when they would shut us down in the name of being healthy and they would not have any care for the health of the souls of the people of God. Wolves will have their way. And again, increasingly, as they see that Christians are the problem, we with our, uh, our message of the good of God and of the good of discipleship and of the evil of men will not be liked or tolerated even increasingly as the day approaches when the church will have no more opportunity to witness in this world. And then there is even a problem in the families, in the very root of society. A brother, verse 21, will deliver brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Oh, that's a terrible thing. Maybe the most terrible thing. When families are divided over religion. Do you know that in your own family? When there's division not only, but There's vengeance and bitterness among those in your own skin, your own DNA, who say, you are wicked. You are wicked for promoting this Jesus Christ and a a religion that's following him and him alone. I've had that in my own family. And may you never have that in your own family, but this is what is predicted here. This is even a prophecy of the Old Testament of an apostasy that's almost unconscionable. Your own skin, your own flesh and blood would turn against you in the name of uh, religion and being more pious than you even. Besides that, in all society, and I believe that's what Jesus is saying here in verse 22, when this general word, you will be hated by all men for my name's sake, that's saying as a general societal um, Uh, wolvishness among the people of this society that yields hatred. This is the problem. Wolves. I send you among wolves as sheep among wolves, Jesus says, in areas of religion, areas of politics, in family, in all society. This is today. This is precisely what we're seeing today. Just think of all society how the religion of Christianity is being tempted to be not Christianity anymore. In fact, now really, instead of Christianity, Christianity, we have American Christianity in America. It's a form of Christianity that is more maybe nationalistic or more whatever than it is Christian more tolerant even as the politicians are and the policies of the government are than Jesus Christ himself who would not tolerate any sin and any unholiness in the church of Jesus Christ. This is now what we're being fed. The lies of the world, the lies of compromise, the lies of what is good and fun and interesting for young people, this will sell you. This will make sure that you have advertised on your internet as you surf it and as you Facebook and all this other stuff. We'll tell you what's right. We'll tell you what's fun. We'll tell you what's meaningful. Young people, these are the wolves. You are exposed to the wolves today when you're exposed even to people who dress up in nice clothing, in cultured clothing, who dress up as grandma waiting for riding hood to eat her up. There are wolves behind the clothing, behind the facade, behind the smiles, behind the fancy cars. Be careful of this world. It's wolvish. And Jesus warns us, Behold, I send you out 
a sheep among the wolves. He doesn't keep us from the wolves. He doesn't say, I'm going to go out instead of you because I can handle these wolves. He doesn't say, I send you out in tanks among the wolves or with great physical armor to keep the wolves at bay. He simply says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What is he doing? What is he doing? Why is it that Jesus prayed, as we talked about in our Bible study, prayed to the Father, I pray not that they should be taken out of the world, but that they should be in the world. It's a similar thing. Why does Jesus send us to the wolves? Why is that? It doesn't seem like a very good shepherd sort of thing to do. In fact, it's the act exact opposite, isn't it? It's the exact opposite of what a good shepherd would do. The good shepherd would defend against the wolves and would take his sheep into the fold and, and surround the fold with other helpers and dogs to keep the wolves at bay, but not send them to the wolves. How can that be a good shepherd who would do that? What do you think of that? Why do you think Jesus does this? The key to understanding this is to understand a concept that's brought out in and throughout this whole passage here to the end of the chapter. Jesus, when he's commissioning his disciples, is commissioning them to be among the wolves for his own name's sake. That's the whole key to this. There's something here about this sending of Jesus, this official commissioning of Jesus, of his apostles to go into the wolves. It's all about Jesus. You have, for example, in verse <coughs> 18, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And then, verse 22, you'll be hated by all men for my name's sake. And if you look down further into the rest of this whole passage that is very similar, all of a piece, it's all about being worthy of Jesus. And he who does not take his cross, verse 38, and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So for my sake and for my name's sake, for me, this is why I'm doing this. Now, again, that may sound cruel. And I sound why he's just throwing these sheep not only under the bus, but to the wolves, to the wolves. But a key word here is the second word of the text, or the third word, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. I send you. I don't throw you there. I send you. You're on my mission for my name's sake. There's something here greater than the sheep and greater than they who are acting as shepherds on the good shepherd's behalf, it's Jesus. I send you. This is my mission. This is your authorization. You're on my behalf for my sake. There's something even divine here that Jesus would be teaching in the suffering of the apostles, in the suffering of the church, in the suffering of ministers, for the cause of the gospel. It's this, Jesus' own suffering, Jesus' own death for us, the salvation that Jesus earns in the way of suffering. This is what they're going to reflect. 
They're going to be His disciples, His apostles, with His message, His word, His power, and also His humbleness and His suffering for righteousness' sake so that God in Christ gets the glory. This is the point of it. Jesus commissions other agents of his, his gospel ministry so that there can be this witness, this reputation, this honor of Jesus Christ that's being upheld. Jesus Christ is going to be exalted here. It's going to be about wolves getting at and tearing at the flesh of Jesus. It's all presaging that great event at the end of Jesus' own earthly ministry, when they will shout, crucify him, crucify him. Those sheep of Israel, those lost sheep, turned wolves, having nothing to do with the Son of God. Precisely, this is why he sends them. Sends them. There's a greater thing going on than merely the suffering of men. And dog eating dog and wolf eating sheep. It's about the good news of a God who sends his own son and his church on his behalf for the sake of the salvation of the people of God. This is what life's all about. Light out of the darkness. Grace where there's sin that abounds. God coming into the flesh, God among the wolves, not God among the nice people, not God among those who are receptive to anything that is good, but God among those who would tear at him and devour him if they could. This is our mission. The apostles who were sent out as sheep in the midst of the wolves were to behave in a certain way. We've talked about the situation, and we talk about the sending, and the apostles here were to behave in a certain way. And the first thing that they were to do is to remember that they were sheep. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is something very important for any minister of the gospel to remember. Ministers of the gospel, elders, deacons, officials in the church, you're just sheep. You're just sheep. You think you're going to be a great shepherd and on behalf, you're the under shepherd, you're in great dignity. True, there's an honor, but you're just a sheep. And you are, but you are by the grace of God making you a shepherd and making you a saved sheep, but you're just a sheep. So you're to be as a sheep. And the apostles here are humble right as they go out and they receive this great power. (laughs) Imagine that, receiving the great power. I wonder if they felt it in them. The uh, the power to say to this this COVID-19, be gone, and the person's healed. The power to say to to anyone you came across, all manner of diseases, all manner of sicknesses, to say, be healed, and you're healed. Imagine that power. Imagine what the disciples were thinking. They'd seen the power that now was given to them in Jesus themselves, and they now would be able to exercise this. Imagine that power. They'd be thinking, man, behold, I send you out as doctors in the midst of wolves. No, sheep in the midst of wolves. Behold, I send you out as great healers in the midst. No, sheep in the midst of wolves. That's all you are. That's all. And don't let it get into your head. And be proud about the fact that you're doing all these miracles. And don't expect that everybody's going to love you because you're healing them. And notice that, the wolves. Maybe the wolves even who are healed by the disciples are still wolves. And they still go after the sheep of God. And that's all you are, just sheep, Jesus says. So be a sheep. What ought good sheep to do, uh, to be doing? Well, Jesus here is referring to what sheep ought to be doing. And he's not saying, be as sheep. I send you out as sheep who are stupid, but as sheep who are dependent, who need and who know the need of the shepherd, and they're going to be those sheep who hear the shepherd's voice and follow him. That's what he's saying. Rely on me. 
I send you out as sheep. Remember, I'm the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. And you rely on me. And when people see this, that you're relying on someone else and not yourself and your own power and your own word, then they're going to be looking to me. So be a sheep. And then Jesus says, you sheep in the midst of wolves, here's what especially you have to do. Be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves with reference to your being among the wolves. Now, what does this mean? Now, when Jesus uses these figures of speech to describe the attitude and the character of the sheep, he's not uh, meaning that in every, every point we should be exactly as a serpent or exactly as a dove, a dove which is rather brainless, or a serpent that has venom in him and that attacks people. Of course not. But there are certain attributes, as it were, of serpents and doves uh, to which we should be thinking and we should have them for ourselves. Serpents are known for being cunning. They're, being, they're known for being watchful about enemies, watchful of being stepped on, watchful of anything around their surroundings. And they're said in Genesis 3 to be the most cunning of all of the creatures of the, of the, that God has made. Cunning or shrewd, protective of themselves, protective of their head and so on. And very, very adept at getting away and sliding under a rock and slithering through the grass and, and disguising themselves and so on. And this is what Jesus is saying here that the sheep ought to be, as those who are wise among those wolves and not exposing themselves um, foolishly to the wolves themselves, not running into danger, not sliding into danger, but being those who are careful, those who are prudent, those who are wise, wise as serpents is fitting here. And then when there's doves, it seems the exact opposite of a snake, the idea there is they are to be peaceful, they are to be gentle. They are not to be those who are a threat in themselves to anyone they witness to, but as the dove itself, the symbol of peace, and so on. Besides, as Jesus was baptized and there descended the Spirit as a dove upon him, it's become to be the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so you would say that the sheep are to be filled with the Spirit. They're to be crafty, but they're to be religious, and they're to be full of the fruits of the Spirit, kindness and gentleness and joy and love and so on, something that is not um, a threat to people except those who reject the gospel wholesale. There's different verses that I'd like to uh, share with you that describe this kind of attitude. Jesus, of course, had it. He was as shrewd as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Paul had it himself. And also we are to have it. James 3, verse 13. Who is wise among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. There you have the serpent wisdom and the dove peaceableness together. Romans 16, 19. I want you to be wise in what is good and simple, dove-like, concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. That's the promise in Romans 16, 19. Paul speaks of himself as being kind of a snake uh, in, in the good sense, wise, when he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 16 that he was crafty and caught the people by cunning. And again, he's using these analogies of creatures who would catch the people, and he's referring to himself um, fishing for men and being winsome to men in the gospel presentation. This is similar to what he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 22. He's speaking about all things to all men, that he might by all means save some. To the weak he's weak, to the strong he's strong, to the Jew he's a Jew, to the Gentile he's a Gentile. Doesn't matter. He's going to be this chameleon-like person, this shrewd person, this wise person, and this dove-like person. He's seeking to win them. Colossians 4, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. There's this combination of the serpentine wisdom and the dove-like peaceableness and winsomeness that's together to be a character of the saints. And so they are to show this in all their areas of life. 
And the question is, do we? The urgent question is, do we? This is so important. So important. Someone has likened it to this. Having a, ni a, a wonderful balance between religion and policy. Religion and policy. I'll explain what that means. Religion is, well, the dove. The dove. And the dove should be harmless and full of the Holy Spirit and, and pious and, and winsome that way. And policy refers to, well, the, the shrewdness that maybe a church undergoes in its witness. And we undergo in trying to witness to the world. It's so easy, isn't it, to have one or the other. We can have a dove-like religion, but be fools and be stepped on and be those who are not wise. And when the persecution comes, we just sit there and don't flee to a city or let ourselves be um, taken uh, down the wall of Damascus, like Paul says, in a basket to avoid the persecution and to avoid the, the threats of the devil. Well, it can be a case in which our policy, on the other hand, the way we do things, gets in the way of our religion. I'm reminded of the policy uh, that a uh, certain church of which, with which I was affiliated had in mission work in Jamaica. And the idea there was to protect the missionary and his family from um, the, the riots and, and the thugs and, the, and the, there's some evil people down there, the wolves. And so what they did is they built a great big compound for the missionary and his family with gates and barbed wire and dogs and so on so that nobody could get in. Well, it's questioned, it's, it's to be questioned, however, whether such policy of protecting ourselves and being careful, being very careful that nobody uh, bites us or bites our head off, if that interferes with our religion and our witness. Jesus says, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. And so may our policy and our religion not contradict what he wants us to do there, to be there in the midst of the wolves. You see, in the midst of the wolves, the sheep are to win the wolves. The sheep are to be there to gain the wolves if possible, not just to run from them all the time or to protect ourselves from them. This is the, the a tremendous assault of Christianity upon the, the captured shores of the devil's empire. We come and we're assaulted, but we're to win the people over. We can forget that when our policy gets the way, in the way or our dovishness makes us fools. There has to be a combination of these things of wisdom and shrewdness and also being as harmless as doves. And so among religious people, beware of them. But be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves among them. Before the religious councils, don't answer back when they, when they fight their fight and when they slander you. Beware of them, but be as a sheep and as wise as serpents and harmless as doves among them. When you are brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them, to the Gentiles, to be as sheep among them, don't worry. Don't worry. Rely on Jesus Christ. God will give you the spirit of my father. Your father will give you, Jesus says, just what you need to say. You don't have to worry that you might not have the proof text for this or that. Or you might not have the courage. But as you're being a sheep and as wise as a serpent, and as harmless as doves, relying on your great God, he's going to care for you in that situation as well. And when there's family problems, to go on to the family place where it is all um, uh, in, um, divided, as Jesus predicts here, what can we say to that? How are we going to be sheep in the midst of that family crisis? Well, beloved, in the first place, we are to prepare. To prepare against that day when it will be that family members will rise against us. And here's the first thing we do, men of God, household leaders. Pray for your families. Church of Jesus Christ, pray for your church family and have good families. However much you put into your work, men, as leaders of the family, leaders of the church, put your time into your wife, into your children, you will never regret it. 
You'll never regret not having the extra $50,000 that you would have had if you'd just given your life over to working for a living and bringing home the bacon. Beloved, it's not about, first of all, bringing home the bacon, but it's about bringing many sons and daughters to Christ in your home and raising them in the fear of God. It's about loving your wife, giving your life for her, caring for her, gentle with her, and so on. Oh, beloved, then when the time comes, sadly, when there is rebellion in the home and division, you'll be ready with meekness and with God-reliance. You'll be hated by all men for my name's sake, but as you're a sheep and wise as a serpent and harmless as dove, you're going to be those who are going to be Christ, and that's the most important thing. In all of this, beloved, we are to be sent as those who are on behalf of Jesus, and those who love him, those who are his sheep, those who are wise as serpents and harmless as doves for his sake. And Jesus promises you're going to be saved in the end. And this is exactly what we need as encouragement. He endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. Surely I say to you, you will have gone, not gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Here's a promise of salvation. Uh, verse 23 has been said to be one of the hardest verses in the Bible to interpret because Jesus seems to be here uh, speaking of something that <clears throat> didn't happen. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, you will have not gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Well, that didn't happen, did it? He's commissioning the disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he says to them, it's not going to be long. In fact, before you're even done with your work, and I'll be coming again. Well, beloved, obviously Jesus isn't mistaken here. He's the Son of God. This is the Word of God. And his prophesies, uh, prophesying is always true. The idea is simply this. It will be the case that shortly there will be the Son of Man delivered to death, but also victorious. When that happens, beloved, Jesus himself says, this is the beginning of his coming. When Jesus Christ was before the, uh, the religious rulers and they asked him, are you the Son of God? He said, yes, I am. And surely, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. He was predicting just when he would be victorious, and that is, when he died and rose again. Then, from then on, he would be coming into the world. It's a reference simply prophetically to his victory. And this is what Jesus is alluding to. It's going to be, such is the case, that as you're in your mission, and I die, and I go away, and I rise again, there's going to be this victory. You're going to see the Son of Man coming, then in your own in your own experience of my resurrected life. I'm going to be seen by you 40 days, for 40 days after I rise again. There's going to be this appearance of me. That's the first time that he actually appears to them. He's going to then pour out his Holy Spirit. He comes that way. 70 AD, when Jerusalem is destroyed, the Son of Man comes in a big way in this type of the end of time when the people of God who went by that name are rejected of God and he goes and tells them to go into all the world. And then from then on, the church sees the Son of Man coming. Jesus Christ is coming. And this is the assurance that he endures to the end will be saved. Because Jesus Christ who sends us out comes then to take us home. And beloved, we need not fear then. All of this hatred, hated of all men by, for my name's sake, all of this division, all of this misunderstanding, all of this walking among the wolves, running from the wolves. And it's not wrong, by the way, to, to run from the wolves as long as you're not being a coward. Jesus says, flee when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. If they're open to the gospel in another city, that's more time profitable spent. And so when people rejected, you can flee. 
It's up to your own discernment and, and your own courage, and you have to decide for yourself when it's time to flee or when it's time to stay. Jesus did that, passed through the midst of them, or he stood. Jesus, uh, Paul himself, fled, or he stood. And this is the wisdom that's required of those who are sheep of God. Beloved, we're in this world, but it's hard. In fact, it's extremely hard, if not impossible. And But for the grace of God and answers to prayer, we just melt, we'd be eaten up, or we'd be compromised, we wouldn't be shrewd as serpents, we wouldn't be harmless as doves, we'd try to get back and to get even. That's so important that we do not do these things. 